okay, we're finally on our way. And obviously, it's a Yukonto game, so <laughs> I'm going to run into problems right away. And those problems are, I look in the sequence of play, no nice little uh, abbreviated section for it, but whatever. I look in the sequence of play and find myself, all right, what do I do? Well, the first thing I should be doing, actually, is casting my spells, uh, which I should actually have done. Uh, because not only is it a Quinto game, it's also me playing a game. I, of course, neglected to read that. Um, but then why I'm on here is I rolled for the initiative, and I know it's done by dice. I don't quite follow the rules on the dice, but that's okay. And, but I'm curious, hey, does high roll mean you just go first? Or does high roll mean you have a choice of where you want to go in the order? This could be of some, you know, difference in terms of how you play. Well, unfortunately, that's not answered. At least not in the sequence of play. Um, it's not answered in the basic, uh, basic flow, as far as I can see. Of course, I'm not terribly good at this. Sequence of play says moving player. All players determine which player is the moving player. All right, that's fair enough. Maybe it's going to be down here. No, the next step is movement. So now I've got to start hunting through the rules to find that thing. Or I can just say, screw it. Uh, I may just re-roll because I've forgotten to do the spells. Uh, so now I have to <sighs> go to one of the harder parts of the game, which is figuring out, you know, what spells I want to cast, how much magic I want to spend on the strategic movement side of things, la la la. And I also probably have to go look up because, you know, the rules are divided into advanced and non-advanced, and the advanced rules aren't kind of embedded in the sequence of play. And there's no advanced sequence of play or anything like, or optional sequence of play or anything like that that, you know, covers everything in the game. So now I have to hunt through and kind of pick and see, hey, are there any optional rules? And really the only one that could apply here is maybe the spies have some effect before um, before uh, I, I get going. So, all that given, and my attitude towards this game all along, I'm probably going to skip, uh, you know, wander away from it for a while. I thought I'd be able to get one player turn in or something. No. <laughs> I just don't have the spirit to be coping with this right now. And it's pretty much preventing me from playing anything. Download that I thought would have been done by now is not so yeah I'll jump in and try to look okay let's go back here spies well unfortunately they don't tell you when the spying is done um <laughs> uh, okay so I'll allow that to be done now because it'll help inform my magic use and I think all the spies are going to be doing an information gathering they're all in a location where they have things they want to reveal and what's going to happen there is uh everything's announced well a lot of stuff's announced any military personalities there or non-military personalities are announced uh any money or magic items the quantity of them are announced the exact number of other items and the exact number of military units so I don't get the full view of what I'm sitting on, but I do get a fairly good idea of the overall worth of the st stack in terms of, you know, is there loot there, whatever, as well as the number of units that I could score, but also the strength of the stack. Nothing precise, but precision doesn't really matter in this game. Uh, there's enough different random factors, etc. in play that I don't know what those are going to be. So, essentially everybody knows what's in their spy stacks. What does that matter? Damn if I know. <laughs> but that's going to inform what spells I may or may not cast. All right, well, that was enough for now. We'll see if my download's up, and if it's not, uh, I guess I'll grab some scrap paper and start trying to plot out those spells. Okay back to this. I've been sick for a week, so. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the, um, and had no desire to face this. So I was a little wrong about the movement, uh, about the uh, spellcasting procedure. 
it has all the overhead of a plotted movement of a plotted casting system like uh, Barbarian Kings has. Uh, unfortunately, it isn't plotted exactly. What happens is you roll the dice and players get their choice of, and, and I already did that, all, all these spies have done their spying, so I know what's in each of these hexes, more or less, like how big a force it is, which is important because I might blast that force with a spell. Then what happens, and this is just, this is inane, um, the person who got the highest roll will cast all their spells first. The procedure will be followed until all players have cast all board movement spells. Okay. The high scorer puts a spell marker, and I have some of these here. And these would be really useful if there were two of them, because then you could mark the spell you're casting and mark the hex that you're casting it into. No, you don't do it that way. You put this on the hex that you're casting it into, and then you record what the spell is, but you announce it as far as I can see. You announce which spell you're casting, and then you write it down <laughs> as to what you're doing. Now, this just lasts for a very short period of time. I think it would be a lot more interesting to say, hey, there's magic coming, but you don't know what it is or whatever. No. Nope. Uh, and because they want to do it simultaneous, you have to track it ahead of time. Well, that would work fine if you had two counters with the same number, and you put one down here and one over there. And I don't know, I may pull out 20 number counters, actually 22 number counters, and, and try to track it that way because it's just fucking ridiculous uh, to be writing stuff down like this. I should have a bag of extra counters, which maybe I'll just repurpose for this, but on the other hand, I'm probably not going to play this more than once, maybe not through the full game. Uh, definitely, though, not enough thought was put into this process. You know, a, a, a hidden casting system, that would make sense to have to write things down. Supplying the extra 22 counters, well, you know, that would cut into counter mix up elsewhere. There's no question about that. But maybe instead of giving you 22 of these, give you 11 duplicate pairs. That's probably not enough for a four-player game, but, you know, at least it supports a, a system where you don't have to be writing down secret information. What, you don't have to write down information that doesn't need to be tracked secretly. I don't know. Buying has been done. That's the first thing. And a number of the counters have been removed. I think it's two turns later. I don't want to face looking or anything up in this rule book. It's just so horribly uh, formatted and everything. If I think I remember something, I'm going with it. It's close enough, <laughs> you know. Um, and the spies who are still on the map covering a piece, that's a piece that actually still exists at this point. We had, you know, hey, look, looks like we're friendly on this border, right? At least that's the impression. I think the goblins are actually going across here. They have the A here, but that's not obvious right now. So, you know, blue feels a little bit more comfortable about what's going on there, but so does green in terms of I'll probably not be facing as much opposition as I thought it would. Uh, elsewhere, let's see, over here, this was kind of a middling force, but this is the main orange battle force, uh, this big A unit here. I've got, I'm not worrying about the letters on the counters, but obviously if you were playing an opposed game, you wouldn't put your heaviest force in A and then downward from there and have all your, you know, blank counters be later in the alphabet. <coughs> but I don't have to worry about that. I, I just uh, don't. Okay, now it's time to actually pick the spells, though. And I, f like I said, I found one big space here. Blue found, yeah, what's sitting in this habitation, and red found what's sitting in this habitation. Uh, orange found a fair-sized force, but nothing too, too huge over on their border there. That looks like a defensive force, but we're not sure. Okay, now the actual choice of spells. You gotta be careful with your spell points because if you use the, you know, they regenerate very slowly. 
when you take a spellcaster out of action, you only get two spell points per turn. I also have to be careful over here with the Beastmaster. His Beast Lord with the big 12 spell points is not on the map yet. Showing up on turn one, but I didn't record where he's showing, but I vaguely remember. I think it's like the Goblin Corner or something. Um, okay, so let's take a look at what we have. So many of these are just movement spells, which I have to kind of look at and say, okay, is there anything that I really need to do? So like green may do a part water here, but I feel like I have a certain surprise factor <clears throat> if I don't um, tip my hand too much there. So maybe I don't want to cast that, and I think I'm not going to for that simple fact. But in other cases, let's see, the big one, well, like this one, I can see, hey, is this a dummy or is it real? But I don't get to see as much as the spy sees. So that's not interesting. And here, cloak, for example. So this is where the player order here is really huge. If somebody throws the all-seeing eye onto you and they went before you, well, you can cloak at any point. Right, if you want to spend a magic point, and it's fairly cheap. Storm, this is uh, the big combat one. Here you make a roll to see how many units you can teleport, and, you know, I guess if you need quick reinforcement somewhere or if there's something particularly vulnerable that works but you're not going to be able to teleport a big army somewhere so that's not terribly useful here's another option if you're getting uh, if there's spells going on that you don't like if you go late in the turn you have the capacity to counter them I, there are so many things I'd rather see I'd either rather see the completely uh, uh, Completely hidden plotting of spells, although that would be a royal pain in the ass, that's not what I thought we had. Or I'd rather see um, first player cast one spell, and each person cast one spell at a time uh, until everybody passes or something like that. Or maybe even just if you pass, you're no longer casting spells and you give up the initiative. So somebody who keeps casting spells gets to cast them. No, it's not like that. Uh, the way it looks like it. Uh, well, actually, it's not certain because of the damn way these rules are written. And these are se second edition rules that are supposed to be the better ones. Um, it says, this procedure will be followed until all players have cast all board magic spells. That sounds almost like it'll, it'll go around, except they say the high score player will cast all board magic spells first. And there's nothing that indicates otherwise that um, they're going to be done with some kind of sequential type basis. Now, obviously, I could house roll all this crap, but man, I just don't have, I, don't, I barely have the will to play the game, and I'm already, you know, going to be doing the tactical battles in a slightly different manner. Uh, let me see if I can figure anything out that I want to do. So far, Green and blue had no spells they even wanted to cast. Uh, anything kind of tips their hand at this point, and I'd rather hold off on burning spell points. Oh, found my number counters. I'm going to use ones out of Source of Denial. Um, red has an interesting option. They found a big force that looks like it's possibly poised to attack them, but they're not going to use their spell points either. For one thing, they don't have their Beastmaster. By the way, he's coming in against the goblins, not the elves. Um, He's not coming in until turn two anyway, so. The other is, de -de 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 -de. Um, sure, I have this magic user here I could blast. And there are three things, I, there are basically two spells I could do. There's spells that could slow or stop that unit from moving, which would buy me some time. And if I was coming in against the Alps, hey, maybe I would do that. But um, there's also the possibility of attacking it with a storm, which just uses the firepower table 
and it doesn't cause it doesn't give me that much pain so each point that i get gives me 10 combat factors which means i get to roll on the chart at a fairly high level and probably damage or destroy a few units but that's a huge fucking stack this is their uh a stack which is quite large and It'll use the normal combat rules, and so do sieges, and I actually didn't explain those, but they're not too exciting. I kind of glossed over them. I didn't explain ever, anything in this game completely. <coughs> um, but, you know, it's basically a firepower table situation. The only kind of neat thing to it is how the losses are allocated. You stack the units up, and you take one from each stack, and the stacks are, you know, by type, unit type. So, uh, that. That's kind of the only thing that I think I left out of the, the description that I gave. Now, the problem with that is I can't do a whole hell of a lot of damage. So I'm going to look at my victory point card over there, and I don't care much about my pieces. Uh, granted, the elves could rack up some serious points if their card works for it, but I don't care that much about them. And for now, I'm willing to let them, you know, take out some of my uh, hamlets and such not. And you can see they're not well defended for that very reason. I also put the regular loot in those. I have the magic loot with my main army because that stuff's actually valuable to me and it's my main army that I'm worried about there. And I have most of my troops that are on defense. I mean, these things are basically undefended. I have like a zombie in each of these. I have some kind of troll or something in that one. But the rest of my force is all stuck in the castle. And that's the thing I'm willing to fight for. And the dragon, I think, protects that. I think this is, it looks like a different thing, so it's probably the castle. It's hard. You can't tell the counters part. So I'm going to pass as well. I don't know if orange has anything they want it to do. Um, oh. I also found this force, but that's, oh, wow, I found lots of forces. But again, same, same, same factor in play. I don't particularly want to attack any of these things, uh, which means orange is the next one. What did they find? They found a moderate-sized green force. Again, probably not worth burning spell points for. Um, I might want to burn them during the combat phase, but at this time, I just don't see it. Um, I could cast spells on my own things and move them a little faster. I'd rather wait until I've tipped my hand to do that, I think. So, that gets us to whatever the next step is. I really should, if I had paper here, ah, I might have some index cards. I don't know if I brought them. Um, I should, like, make the sequence of play somewhere because uh, digging through the rule book to find it is not going to be fun either. So I don't know what we're on. I don't know what we do. We're moving into the movement phase, I guess. Uh, roll a bunch of dice, see who what the ordering is. The elves get to go first. And now, there's nothing too exciting here, but there are some problems that arise. Um, some of them because of optional goals. One of the interesting things is, each side has its own movement and combat values, its own terrain that it likes. I like that factor to the game. Um, but it, uh, it is going to make things a little bit more difficult to get used to. But the other thing is, uh, the thing that I was worried about here. So, okay, great. I've got, uh, you know, I've got to move blue first. Well, my scouts are kind of lousy <laughs> because they don't have, uh, they don't have a capability because they're moving first to jump on a useful stack later. But, you know, again, Sometimes your scouts will be useful as scouts, sometimes they won't. And I can always run them in and try to do an assassination or something like that, or degrade a, a defensive situation. And I may do that. This guy may stay here and try to degrade this, because that's going to probably be my goal for the turn. Blue's moved into position to attack here. I've moved my bigger stack here. I want to... My big points are against the Beast Lord. That's where I'm going to hit first. Uh, and... It's the moving player's turn throughout the sequence, so uh, it's possible I could have run through an enemy troop or something. I'm putting 
some decoy type action up here to make the goblins a little worried. Uh, likewise, pushing a little forward on the humans here, but my goal is the beast lord. And now uh, I'm hitting this settlement. Now I have to make a decision whether I want to commit the spy to try to remove the defensive bonus for the settlement. <sighs> the problem is if my spy gets killed, I'm out a spy and that would be terrible. But if, uh, you know, if I don't use it, I'll probably suffer a little bit more losses in the attack. Um, I'm not sure which way to go with this. I left him there with the idea of doing, of, of using him, so I guess I will. This is resolved, is the spy player is gonna get two dice, the defending player gets one die, but he gets a plus one to his die roll. And if, I, if the spy exceeds the defending player's roll, he succeeds in his mission. Otherwise, well, we'll see, we'll see what the results are. So I got a nine to a two, I'm seven points over. Um, and now we look here, if the result is negative three or less, minus two to plus to three, it's uh, just a failure. I got a success there. So I get to ignore the defensive value of that location uh, during the siege. The siege, we use the basic battle system with some modifications. One of the modifications is terrain doesn't matter except for the terrain of the habitation, which in this case, it's a hamlet or lair. So the attacker will be at minus two, the defender will be at plus one. Now I believe that's die roll modifications. I have to find the combat chart, here it is. And I think that's the same in every location. And if I recall correctly, I add up all the combat factors and that may generate a bunch of different die rolls that add up hits. And those hits are actual units that are destroyed. No fight withdrawal procedure when you're fighting a siege combat. Uh, so this is what I have here now. Uh, I constantly have to look up because of the numbers. I know that bottom number is movement. The other numbers. Combat and then morale. Okay. I don't remember what the fuck morale does. Uh, so the combat factors for this are going to be 10... 11 because this is allowed to defend that doesn't give me very much we'll roll our hits here uh, and we roll two dice on each shot on the table so the 10 and what was our bonus uh, we don't have it because it was uh, sabotaged so we're going to do 12 hits. Looks like uh, 14 hits. Wow, that was pretty hefty. And for now, I'll mark that like this. And we'll figure out what the losses actually are. I didn't want to use any magic here. I don't even know if I have a magic user here. So here I have Four, eight, nine, ten, eleven, seventeen. 9, 10, 11, 17. Uh, I don't know if Bowman work differently in the siege. Let me see. Bowman work the same as they do in a regular battle as far as I can tell. So what I have to do is, uh, there's no archery here. So before I do that 14 hits and assess that, I have to worry about these archers. Now these guys are three points each. One, two and they each fire individually, I think. So they have a low chance of hitting something. Um, let's see if I can find this. If archery units make a missile attack from the battle line, they get a plus two die roll in the combat. So there's the choice of which line you wanna put units in. It seems to me, unless you're afraid of losing archers, for example, you probably want them in the battle line because they get the they get a first fire then, and they have significant bonuses. So 
that's what we're going to do here. Now, I should look up to see if there's special damn rules for any of these units. You know, compared to like um, uh, the presentation, at least in the version of Dragon Pass that I have, yeah, there's all kind of complicated special stuff there. But the presentation kind of lets you see what all that information is a little bit better. Here, uh, the, the special rules aren't really noted on the counters in any way. Yes, they the numbers in Dragon Pass and the symbols and everything kind of clutter up the counters. But they do kind of attract your attention to, there's something special about this. I gotta look this up, whatever. Here, I don't even know what the hell I've got, right? I gotta look these suckers up. I've got... Uh, I've got a water troll. I don't know why. I guess that's the water there. Uh, this thing is a hill troll. I'm pretty sure there's nothing special about a hill troll. And there's no mark that anything's special here. And this is just a civilian. So that's not too special. Uh, so let me make sure, but I don't think there's anything special about water trolls. Uh, <coughs> so I'll ignore that for now. But what I have to see is these archers. There's this, I gotta also make sure that I'm not looking at the tactical system, which has its own rules for archers. So what do they say here? Uh, an archer in the battle line may attack. The owning player can count the missile before the first round of combat. Missile factor ball. Uh, no, you don't do them individually. That's in the tactical. Uh, okay, so it uses normal, normal combat results. But it has a plus two because it's battle line, guys. So yeah, I just add these up, and I might wait, might wipe out the enemy before he does anything. Three, six, ten. Yeah, you can't just multiply the number of units. You have to look at each unit. Uh, Thirteen, twenty, and he has a magic bow, which is plus two because this is normal combat. That's triple. So I think we're at 26 as the total. I will probably wipe the enemy out. So the first 10, and remember it's at plus two, gets me only a five. That kills two of the units. Now the order in which units are removed, and I could have maybe protected the units by putting them in the second line, but then they can't attack. And with the first line wiped out, I think they get destroyed, so. This is in the optional rules, so now we gotta go back to the battle rules. Over here. Okay, the small units are destroyed first. So, the elves destroy these. Now, I've gotta check the morale rules because these guys might be captured instead. I'm not sure. And then, uh, I've got another 10 at plus 2, and we wipe out that last unit. And I'll be back after I check the morale rolls. And then we have to decide, determine how we're going to handle that location. Whether we want to destroy it or try to hold it or something. A number of options on what to do with this place I just captured. <coughs> the morale is only used in the tactical game. Um, the only way things get surrendered in the strategic game is the player at the end of a round of combat has the option to surrender. And that just really kind of gives you an, an opportunity. It gives you a few things. If the surrender's not accepted, it could cause combat to go differently than it would otherwise. They could get bloodlusted or terrified or whatever. But it also gives the, uh, the winner of the surrendered units this kind of burden of carrying these things around, which they can then slaughter, uh, which looks pretty easy. But the other all, uh, option of why you might want captured units is you could trade them for somebody else's captured units. So if you're not on an all-out destruction against one player, if you don't want to really wreck them necessarily, you might be able to come to some deal where you release their units and they stop attacking you if they have another target that they they're close to as excited about or whatever. So it, they could be a bargaining chip. It doesn't look terribly valuable to me uh, and it wasn't available in this circumstance. So with the city or, or the location, I can just garrison it and hold it 
And if I have it at the end of the game, it's worth my victory, the victory points that I'm supposed to give for. But there are other options. The other options include, I could plunder it, which, if it had items, would make sense. Now, normally you don't know what a, what a location's items are, but I spied the location, so I actually do know how many items there are, and there were none. Therefore, plunder doesn't do much good. I can destroy it, which allows me to just roll on the combat table until I get a certain number of hits. Now, I've got a huge force there, and this is, uh, this is only a hamlet, so I only have to do... I don't know, four to three destruction factors. I don't know what the fuck that's supposed to mean. I think the first set, yeah. I think the first set is... See, this is not very clear. Like what these numbers are supposed to be. But I think the first set is to degrade it somehow so that it no longer has a defensive value. Now, I've already wiped out its defensive value for this turn, so I'm not that worried. But I have to do seven hits against it, I guess. Well, I have a huge amount of uh, attacks. I can probably destroy it without any problem. Um, eight, nine, ten, eleven, seventeen. I could use 10 or the missile, 17 and uh, 27, and then these guys, 37, 47 archers are great in close combat for the elves, 57, so I've, you know, I'm going to wipe it out, but we can roll. Oh, and I have a banner too that gives me plus one. So that did one hit. Ten, that does seven more. So it's wiped out. And now I can score it in my victory point section. And it's just gone. <coughs> that seems easier than trying to garrison things and maybe not being able to hold them. So I was able to take a victory without any losses. The fortification, the thing you're destroying, doesn't get any value. The other option would be to plunder and destroy. Uh, which is really weirdly worded. Again, this game is so damn weird. So they have this plunder and destruction. Well, the way they word that is the, cap the capturing player may plunder and destroy a captured habitation. Plunder occurs before destruction. The two may not be performed in the same turn. It's just so contradictory uh, statement, but given that there's already a plunder and a destruction option, it seems like, and this says you can do both, <laughs> Then it says you can't do both. I, I don't know what it's, you know, uh, supposed to do. But um, the danger of destroying a place is the items get wiped out with each destruction hit. So unless there's a huge quantity of items there, if you're going to destroy a place, you're going to end up knocking out all the items. The plunder makes you uh, make an attack and try to find items. And if you do plunder and destruction, you do the plunder first. So I, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand, you know, but basically you'd get to roll, capture some of the loot and, and, you know, um, then have that as stuff that you can score. And I think you carry the loot around with you. I don't think it gets destroyed, uh, but it may just go in your destroyed box so you can score it. It would make more sense if you're hauling it around though. All righty. Uh, so that is, I think, the first player's turn. I'll make a double check. Otherwise, I need a break. <laughs> Perform their turn. Now, they were set up kind of stupidly, so, you know, where they're trying to attack these goblins. So pushing across the river was kind of difficult to do. <coughs> um, in addition to that, there's nothing in the game that permits you to move things that are too slow across a terrain, even if you could only move one hex. But... Uh, you pay the maximum cost for the terrain, so crossing the river is five, even though I'm kind of in hills on the other side of the river, but whatever. And you got to kind of distinguish which side of the river you're on on the board, I guess. I, again, this isn't all very clearly spelled out. In a lot of ways, this game, and just soloing this game, as opposed to, like, playing the roles, it makes me feel like I don't solo games, and I'm approaching for the first time now. It's 
it, it, it's not just the game. It's you know all the circumstances in my life and everything uh, combining. Where I, I it, it's just very very difficult. Not in terms of oh gosh I don't know what to do, but in terms more of I just don't feel the energy to do it. Also moved kind of jostling for position. They ran their spy around to check out a bunch of the stuff. Remember you find stuff out it for free. There doesn't seem to be a time in the turn when you specifically reveal stuff. At least that I remember, maybe I'm wrong, you know. But again, who cares, right? Uh, and now I'm moving my main force forward here. Elsewhere, I'm trying to create a, an appearance of a screen, but I don't know how much it works, especially since there's a human spy here. So if I send a dummy unit or any unit really in there, he knows exactly what's facing it, and that doesn't, uh, that doesn't really help me much. And finish up with the Beastmen. Uh, they're positioning their spies. They have basically no troops. So they're positioning their spies to find out. They see, yeah, there's something pretty real hitting them here. So that's kind of a problem. There's no way to knock spies out that are not trying to do something nasty. Now, that guy might try to do something nasty, but uh, it might be a good idea. Let me look at the rules for spies, see if I can whack something. Um, but other than that, we're at the end of the turn. We've already, you know, it took like 10 minutes now, uh, uh, you know, actual playing time to get through this part of the turn. But so much angst and everything. But yeah, there aren't a lot of turns. There's only... There should be here. That couldn't possibly be us. Just next turn. Um, it, there's, you know... The strategic game looks like something you could play in a long session if you were familiar with the game. Uh, obviously, if you're throwing those tactical battles in, that's going to add some time to it. And I'm going to give that a try to them without the board and see how that works. Actually, I thought about getting a Chessex board. But yeah, uh, as let me, let me see if I can let me see if I can do do something additional with that spy. And again, it's probably up to my interpretation as to whether or not I can, as opposed to anything that's well-defined in the rules. It is well-defined. I can only do one of these per turn. So finding out what that force was was kind of important, but now I don't have the ability to interact with it. So yeah, that pushes all our put little turn markers on everybody's because they each have units on the turn track. Elves lost a lot there. Um, that I'm not sure should happen. I think if spies reveal an empty thing, you're not supposed to reveal that to other players, but again, for simplicity's sake, because I'm playing many hats and taking so much time between turns and whatnot. And now this means I can run away and go do something more fun. The counters in this game, in conjunction with my failing eyesight and the not terrific lighting I have here, I gotta get some lamps, I didn't bring any with me. But anyway, uh, they're, they're really causing problems. So this I can find. I'm looking, trying to figure out, well, where do I want to do my matching? Now, obviously, I cheated on the last game turn uh, because I had a spy do his spying, and then he did a fortification reduction or whatever. And I don't know how to avoid this. I, I mean, honestly, I'm going to have to start writing down or tracking when spies are used or flip them or something like that. Maybe I'll just keep cheating. Ugh because it's really fucking useless. And they're only allowed to do one per turn. I also cheated, so I'll probably keep doing it by letting Green run around and scout out several different hexes. I don't think he can do that the way it's worded. It's hard to tell. It says he can only do one per turn. It doesn't say he can do it multiple times, but it wouldn't make sense. Um, but I have no idea, you know, how to track that information. I guess, you know, you could make new counters. You could keep it on paper, all kind of crap like that, but the game just really doesn't support it. But here we're coming to another problem, which is I can't find this unit. I need to know where, oh, there he is. Okay. Because I need to know where he is because I can't cast spells outside that range. No. I'm left with a difficult decision here, which is do I want to use, assuming you know, I'm within 12 of A, Do I want to use my uh, magic power to try to smash that orange uh, unit? Or do I want to keep it for my own combat bonuses, you know, in battles where I'm getting points? And I think I'm going to hold on to it simply because 
you know, when I look at my values here, I'm the goblins. We're looking at a, a hamlet or a lair there. And I assume that's not worth much because I ran away from it. That's worth five points. I'm looking at human army and the points per unit for human army. This isn't zero points per unit, but it means whatever. It's like zero added to the strength of the unit or something like that for points. I don't remember. Uh, but elves are really crappy for me to attack. See, elves are only interesting for me to attack because of uh, the locations. So I don't know. But I had thoughts of trying to get through the magic phase again, but it's so fucking painful. I'll just pour my tea and go do something else. Made the major decision not to cast any spells again. Um, the main reason, the mental cost and emotional cost of coping with them. Uh, but the secondary reason is they're an absolutely, not absolutely, but they're a partially limited uh, resource. Which is to say, if I blast a big stack of, say, you know, these humans here, that there's an opportunity cost where I could use those same magic points to blast something I need to blast, which is, say, the elves. And uh, you really want to focus on where your own points are kind of located. Because there is a time limit to the game. It's not a matter of wipe out the enemy's mobile forces and then you kind of win. That's not guaranteed. <coughs> it's also not guaranteed that that doesn't kind of work. But the amount of damage that I would do is fairly low. Um, I'm also not sure what's here. But I have a pretty good suspicion it's a big stack. Why else would they, and same with this, why else would they be crossing the river, right? But anyway, just, <laughs> the point is you only get a maximum of two points back per turn, and that's if you take the mage out of uh, play. So basically you wanna use the mage for one big hit. What one big hit? Well, that's a good question. And so far nobody feels like they've reached it. When I set up a, a battlefield, know what I'm facing it may make more sense and there the points are sort of multiplied because um, they have uh, they have like half cost I think on the battlefield map uh, of course they have less effect in some cases but I think some of them are just as effective uh, well, no, they won't be, because here's the thing, regular battle magic, you get to blast a lot of points at one unit, or at one stack, and it wipes out lots of units. With this, you have to kind of pinpoint and cast your spells so that, you know, you're looking at, well, I don't want to waste points. Well, on a high roll on the zero table, you still waste points, uh, because there's only a couple of units in a hex, so... Yeah, the system doesn't really translate perfectly onto the tactical map. And that, that's the real shame. I'm, I'm looking at the tactical, and we'll see how it plays out, but I have this feeling that it's not going to be that much better than, like, you know, playing Titan or playing some of these games with abstract tacticals. It's a too simple a tactical game. I guess what I kind of want is great battles of history set in fantasy um, with the battles being generated in this kind of manner. Or something like that, you know, something a little stronger than, uh, you know, a very light tactical game. Okay, so the elves ended up getting the first move here. I'm rolling them. And I'm probably not going to have time to finish this turn on this video, but uh, they throw a spy in and find out, wow, that's the goblin big force. And wow, it's huge. Uh, that puts us in a real quandary. Because we kind of like our stuff. Uh, civilians are worth 20 points each. Royal families worth 15. Now that's not exposed out here. The shaman, the wizard is over here. I'm looking to see how much 
our hamlets are not worth anything to us. Okay, I think I think we can afford to ignore the goblins for at least a little while. Try to score some points against the Beast Lord and then turn around uh, with the main force. Now what I do have here, yeah, this is my big force. Um, so what I'm looking at is probably both of those together are gonna have to come up. But that means I don't want this thing exposed, so I'm gonna probably fall back with it because it's a moderately sized foe. After the elves kind of pull back a little bit, most of their value is quite far from the goblins. The goblins are put with also a difficult position because the humans are coming after them. And they don't see humans making movement anywhere else. That means that they can pretty much guess, and they don't have a lot of spies, that these are their big forces. So we're going to have to go gather the goblin army to try to face them down. He's got some interesting information from their spies. Uh, here they found out there's nothing there, so they feel maybe the goblins aren't really defending themselves against us. Maybe they don't care. That'd be cool. However, I wasn't willing to chance attacking here. I'm going to try to gather my forces. The reason being, I, I'm risking a fair proportion of my army here with either of these stacks. If I lose one of them to, say, a big goblin army or something like that, I've got a real problem. So until I know more about what's going on, I probably need to gather my forces. I needed to have them spread out to begin with because I didn't know who's going to attack me. Um, it's kind of a... <coughs> A weird situation like that. It might make sense to do more or less what the goblins had, which is just a couple of huge stacks and just try to, you know, be in a position where you can overrun anything. The goblins are especially potent because they have a higher movement allowance. It's hard to read these counters, but they have an eight movement allowance down here, which is pretty damn impressive. Assuming I have the right numbers, you know, I keep, uh, because I'm not playing all that much. Maybe I'm making an error there. Now that's movement. Okay, cool. Uh, and it appears to be that they're consistent on all the counters where things are. That lower right number serves a number of different purposes, but... <coughs> um, so, what the humans are doing is they're trying to gather some forces uh, because they did discover this elven force is quite large. And although it looks like it's going after the Beastman, I don't know. You know, it might be hitting me next or something. So there's not a lot of Beastman points there. Uh, we do have, though, a big siege, which I expect is going to go quite well in favor of the humans. Okay, so uh, the combat's completed, except for one casualty aspect. Um, the goblins actually did quite a bit of hits to the humans simply because there were just a couple of units left, but the bonuses of the fortifications, etc., gave them quite a bit of a, an advantage. And they managed to do nine hits on the humans, whereas the humans only took out all of the goblin units. So sometimes it can be painful. Last time, the archers were able to wipe out, uh, what was it, the beastmen over here. So there was no real fight, it was a small force. Well, here it was a somewhat larger force, and the human archers aren't as potent as the elven archers. So, you know, they had to actually assault, and they lost their poor engineer in the assault. Um, and the result of all that is, well, there's a possibility of casualties. Now, the way the casualties are assessed is each leader had to be assigned to a stack of units. Um, we're gonna look at the, uh, at the leader or personalities that we have. So we have one, two, this is a personality as well. These guys are not. This is a banner or something I'm carrying with me. I don't know, an icon. I'm not sure which it is. Oh, it could be carried by a unit. Okay, so let's look at uh, our guys. So my most important is this Lord. I'm gonna have him stacked with the best units, but each of these is gonna be a, taking two losses, essentially. So what I have to do is roll for each of these leaders, 
and I add two to the die roll. And if I get a six or better, that leader's killed along with his bonuses. So we've got a 50-50 chance of losing each of our three leaders. Uh, I'm sorry, only plus one because of, uh, so only on a five or six, because the first loss doesn't count. Okay, so let's look at our Lord or whatever there. Oops, he's dead. And his thing is captured as well. Same with this guy. Oh, it would suck if I lose my magic user this way. Well, it looks like I'm losing my army's leadership. Yeah, everybody's dead. Okay. And that means I can bag my big spellcaster number two with 10 magic points. I was planning on saving this guy. Oh, I'll put this over here just <coughs> as a reminder, but I was planning on saving this guy and using him in the big field battle I expected to have. Well, at the very least I get to plunder. I've got enough troops here uh, that if there was anything there, I would find it, but I'm assured to destroy the city. for the city and or the hamlet and the fourth I don't think is worth any points but it's no longer usable so theoretically these two counters should be going into bags because I don't think they're worth anything and that was the human turn and you can see this is really really bloody uh, and the strategic combat system is essentially what we're using for siege so that's what the normal system would be. There's an opportunity to retreat. Things haven't been going two rounds just because the combat table is really, really violent. Even small forces can cause significant losses as we're seeing here. Beastmaster runs away from this city or Hamlet down to this one. He's got to be careful because he can't get close to the dragon. Um, he can trigger the dragon, I believe. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, he doesn't want to lose his units, the civilians, etc. run away. He'll give up the hamlet, and the elf isn't sure what's going on there. Uh, what he is going to do, though, is he's going to attempt assassinations. So here against Force B. Force B has a leader. Hey, who's this leader? That leader is... That is the Lord. No, that's a hero. Okay, so for an assassination, what happens is, crap. Um, he's gonna roll two dice, and the Lord rolls one die at plus one. So you can see he has the advantage numerically. So eight to two, he gets a kill. Now, because this wasn't a combat, um, yeah, this guy's dead. This sword or whatever is still with the elves, but the Beastmaster gets this, and we're gonna put this magic sword flipped over to remind me that it's useless, but it's worth victory points. People, uh, the troops can carry it, but they can't use it for anything. And likewise, we'll take a shot. Force A here. Uh, so let's try to see what we have. Leadership wise, looks like we have one leader. He's carrying a couple of pieces of equipment, and that is the Lord. Well, the Lord is also a magic user, and that's somewhat problematic. Assassinating the King, Lord, or Chieftain would be a plus two. Assassinating a magic user is at plus four. Are they cumulative? It's not clear. I'm going to say they are. Just to make life harder on the Beastmaster, I guess. So that's a plus six. Okay, 12 to eight is a four point differential. Let's see. Uh, the assassination fails and the spy is apprehended. Um, I believe that means he's captured. I'll look that up. Let's see. 
Yeah. That may not be failed attempt. He's destroyed. Okay. So if spies are worth anything, which they may be. don't see it so it's probably not worth a damn thing but anyway that's in his kill pile now oops wrong spy this one succeeded the other one failed all right that is the end of turn two and we push these forward we've got some counters coming into play which I will return to the players but as of right now, I'm going to load this up. So far, we still haven't seen a tactical battle. The game's moving pretty quickly. Um, the strategic system really wipes the troops out fast. At least when large forces are colliding. Let's send this up.